well, you know, I'd like, I'd like to tell these people around me that they're not going to suppress my life anymore and I'm going to express my full uniqueness. But what I thought is, you know, there's something coming up. I don't want to upset people, so, so I'll, I'll put it off. I'll do it next week. All the time we can do this. Now, we either want to be free or we don't want to be free. We're going to go for it. We're not going to go for it. Of course, there's diplomatic ways of doing it, but so often I see, and I do understand it, wanting to avoid what is necessary to achieve what people claim they want, and the excuse list just goes on and on and on and on and on. And instead of uh, you're to blame, it's like, how can I find a situation to explain away why I'm not doing what I say I want to do? Clear your mind. This is a good one. I've uh, done a lot of this over the years from what I used to be. You know, I I have this thing which I, I call the deathbed experience. Or the deathbed reality, even a way of putting it. You're lying on your deathbed, you've got ten minutes to live, and you're looking back at your life. How much of what wound you up, made you unhappy, made you stressed, made your life unpleasant, you got angry about, how much of it in that deathbed experience, ten minutes to go, actually matters? Sodding next to nothing, if that. Nothing! And it's another way that we get trapped in this out there holographic reality, which is getting attached to things that don't matter. You heard what he said about me. I'm disgusted. I'm so upset. Don't give a shit, mate. Don't give a shit. It doesn't matter. What's it matter? You know why it matters? Because you've made it matter. I think that David Icke's mad, crazy, an idiot. Thank you for sharing that with me. End of frickin' story. Write your opinion. I have a right not to be affected by it. Doesn't matter. Thinks I'm I'm crazy? Good luck to him. Ah, brilliant. I don't think I'm crazy. I'm not affected by that. And I don't get stressed. Oh, how can you say that to me? I'm now getting stressed. I'm I'm getting into a a low vibrational state. Why? For something that doesn't matter. If I'm lying on my deathbed, I look at all these people that have heard this abuse at me, and all these situations, I go, that was funny. What a laugh. What a laugh, really. Right? And yet at the time, you can get really caught in it. And if we clear our minds of what matters, because, again, what it is, it's moving our point of observation from this reality to the, uh, the out-of-body reality, because when we're out of body, none of this crap matters. You talk to out-of-body experiences. Hey, a Jill Balty Taylor, when she's having the stroke and went in the right brain as a, the prime reality. Hey, this is La La Land. It's lovely. Oh, it doesn't matter. All that stress is all gone. I haven't got any more. Um, and the trick is moving that perception of the out-of-body, higher consciousness, there is no time, no sequence, all that stuff, moving that into this reality, not ten minutes before we move out of here, but when we're in it and living it and experiencing it, because that will completely change as we move that point of observation, the way we live our life, what we can achieve, and the way we interact with, with, with reality. So much that we think matters doesn't friggin' matter. It doesn't matter. Okay, I'm in another dimension now. What was all that that went on? I can't remember, mate. How are you doing? All right, I haven't seen you since you were, um, you know, uh, in Egypt. And what's it? So, how are you doing now? Doesn't matter. It's just an experience. And this is the sequence that I found uh, people seem to go to and I, I through and I went through. The first stage of the opening to freedom in its true sense is to realize we are in a situation of slavery. Because again, making excuses, hiding from what um, you don't want to face. You know, it's like uh, the, 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 the greatest power over people is when you tell them something they want to hear. So if you tell them uh, that something's happening that they don't really want to think is happening, and then someone comes along and says, ah, oh, load of rubbish, mate, load of rubbish. No, it's fine, honestly. You want to believe this guy, because you want to believe it's fine. And so, um, we are 
in denial of the situation we're in, not people in this room, obviously, but in general, humanity is in denial because they really don't want to face it. So much, much better to hide it, hide away from it. Oh no, it's a load of rubbish, the guy's mad, mate, and all that stuff. But there comes a time if we ignore it when it comes in our face and then we've got to face it. And people come to that conclusion at different points. But first of all, we face the situation we're in. Okay, now we can deal with it. It's like when you're in a, when you're in a situation where you can see the dictator, it's not a very nice situation, but at least you're one step ahead of being in a society that's controlled by dictators you cannot see, touch and taste, because at least you know there's something to deal with. Stage one. Stage two, choosing not to be a slave. Choosing freedom. Real freedom. Not the uh, illusion of freedom that we call freedom. Most people on this planet don't want bloody freedom. I, I, I meet um, people um, in uh, the Christian movement in America. They talk about freedom and some of them talk about this conspiracy on a five sense level and stuff. They don't want bloody freedom. You know, I, I met one once in Tucson. I was talking to him about how the, uh, what happened to the Native Americans and all that stuff, and, and we're going on, and, and this guy is, is such a white supremacist, it's unbelievable. And I said to him, do you know, and, and you know, we were talking, we were talking at an anti-Illuminati bloody rally, right? And I said to him, Look, mate, I don't know um, who <laughs> terrifies me more at the thought of being in power, the people I'm trying to expose, or you, who's trying to expose them as well. They don't want freedom. They want the freedom. They want the freedom to re replace an imposition they don't like with an imposition that they do like, their own belief system. Crikey, I, I've been, you know, harangued uh, by Christian people in America so often because I'm talking about Jesus and stuff and, and the, the Son of God. Well, okay, don't accept it then. You believe that, I'll believe this. We'll have a beer, forget about it. No, must impose myself. You're not interested in freedom. So when we choose freedom, it's real freedom. And freedom, funnily enough, is not the freedom for us to do what we like at the expense of other people. It's the freedom of everyone to have the same rights as us. Freedom is not freedom for us to take the freedom to impose on others. It's accepting the freedom of others the same as we accept the, expect the freedom for ourselves. So, when we talk about banning freedom of speech, oh, no one is against freedom of speech. It's like being ag against, um, uh, you know, wife uh, uh, violence. Um, no one's for that. And no one's um, uh, for um, the end of free speech. But then they start dealing with what free speech is. Oh, no, you can't have free speech to say that. I believe in free speech, but that's going too far. No, you can't be a little bit pregnant, mate. Free speech is free speech, okay? You can't edit it, right? And when it comes to freedom of speech, you know, um, people um, um, should have the right to say what they want and all the rest of it. And anyway, don't we want to know what people think about things rather than it all going on in the shadows and no one knowing what's really going on? Of course, freedom of speech is freedom of speech. It's freedom, funnily enough, for people to take, to say things we don't like and to uh, uh, stand for their freedom to say things we don't like as much as to say, uh, stand for freedom to say what we do like. Freedom is freedom. It's indivisible. So, I choose freedom. I'm not going to be a little bit free, I'm going to be free. And I have a simple philosophy. People say, oh, freedom, that means you do what you like. I have a simple philosophy. Do what you like, so long as you don't impose it on other people. Real simple. And people say, well, no, that would be chaos, that would be anarchy. No, it wouldn't. The opposite of that. Well, what about people who murder people? Well, I think that's imposing the, uh, your will on somebody. Do you think, do you think that might be that? I think, it, I think we might just kind of, you know, I mean, and, and we can do this. Someone wants a party, some, some kids want a party. The local people don't want the noise. What happens in this world now, left brain structure, you've got to make a decision. Are they going to have the party, are you going to have the noise? We'll go to the residents, they've got to vote, okay? Now, what we can do, 
They want a party. They don't want the noise. We must find a place for these kids to have a party where these people are not affected by the noise. Both, everyone's a winner, sorted, harmony. This is what society can do. Most of the problems are not real problems. They're just the fact that we don't want to sort them out because we don't want to uh, change society in a way that will sort them out. Simple as that. And when we choose freedom again, I'll choose freedom, but not when there's an R in the month there's a good match on. And, and not if I have to face this official bloke who looks pretty nasty. I don't choose freedom then. Making excuses. We can make excuses not to express our freedom all the time. And if we do that, then we're never going to be truly free. Then we get, after ex uh, uh, acknowledging our situation, making the choice to change, then we can start the transformation. Why? Because when we go for it, real choice to be free, then everything changes. Energetically we change. What we draw to us changes. People come in and out of our lives that um, add to our understanding and our ability to go down this road of freedom. Everything changes. Transformation. And it's a wonderful thing. It can be a challenge. I, I love this film, The Dead Poet Society. Robin Williams in this uh, film when he's teaching the kids and, and basically saying, look at the world from a different angle. He used to stand on his desk or their desks. And he was asked, why are you standing on the desk? And he said, I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at things in a different way. You see, the world looks very different from up here. You don't believe me? Come and see it for yourselves. Again, when we start to make this transformation, we start to move with it our point of observation of the world. And if we move our point of observation, we're going to start acting in different ways, we are going to start perceiving in different ways, and therefore, again, we've got to let go the fear of what other people think. Oh, you can't stand on the desk, it's stupid, sir. That's what so many people do. Ooh, no, I'll not do that, they'll laugh at me. Boom. Real freedom, choose freedom, no excuses. And you look at uh, the world from a different angle. You stop seeing yourself in these terms. Little me, I can see myself down there somewhere. Looking in the mirror, this is me, hey, it's good. It's a computer, it's a computer. It's, it's a, a wonderful, incredible thinking uh, energy construct with consciousness um, uh, up to a point. And it's the great vehicle for us to experience this world, but it's not who we are. And if we identify with it, we identify, and apart from it being a vehicle, we identify with um, the computer and not us. And when we move our point of observation from the fact that we're little me, and this is, this is me, and I'm Ethel Jones and Charlie Smith, out into the... Uh, greater awareness and we observe us and the world from out there, then the world looks totally different, situations look totally different, we look totally different, and what bothers us and hassles us and all the rest of it just fades away. It doesn't matter. And this energy field changes what we draw in and we can create changes and we are transforming the outer by uh, transforming the inner. As this happens, we start to expand the range of frequencies. We're decoding the levels of awareness that we are able to access to give us insight and intuitive knowing. My God, we're on our way. This is the level of the transformation. This is the level of the revo revolution, if you want to call it that. It's not guns, it's consciousness. And we wake up. And as that happens, we wake up and we go, why didn't I see it before? So many times people have said that. I can see it now, it's so bloody obvious. Why didn't I see it before? Because that's what you were before. And then suddenly, boom, boom, point of observation. Oh my God, it's obvious. And this is happening now, this wake up. It's happening. It can be challenging, mine. Not saying it's a doddle, because that sums up some of the ways I felt over the years and last Tuesday. No, 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 not quite so much now. But this was, this was a great one of me in 1991. I tell you what, that really kind of absolutely encompasses um, symbolically my inner self. And why? Because when we start to transform, 
what we put out changes, what we draw in changes, and the outer world appears to collapse. Oh my God, what do we say? My life's falling apart, mate. Mine did. Because the construct going out fell, the construct it was creating fell, my experience, my life's falling apart. But what happened? As a result of the collapse of that rigidity, that false reality that I was living, as a result of that, bingo, another reality could come. Would I go back, despite everything, to what I was before I started to wake up and went through that shite? No freaking way. No way, thank you very much. No way. Hello, good evening and welcome. Here is this sport. And there's snooker on tonight. I was him? Oh my God! No, that was him. This is me. Different. Simple as that. This is the big, big thing to get over. This is the four-letter word that controls the world. And, you know, I have, it's fear that allows this to happen. You know, this guy's in control because they're following and all the rest of it. Now, if any of these bloody sheep said, sod this for a lark, I'm off, he's in real bloody trouble now, isn't he? Where's the point of control now? It's not on the sodding tractor. He's got a hundred sheep to find. But here, oh yes, oh, bah, bah, bah. bah. Did you see the news last night? Yeah, bah, bah. He's in control, sitting on his sodding tractor, doing bugger all. This is the way the society works. Oh, I better not go out here. I better not go out there. No one's telling you not to, in fact. But it's your. It's again. It's the. It's the. It's the. The mouse in the. Um, in the laboratory maze, oh no, I'm going down there, I'm going down there, oh no, thermal, oh, all that stuff. And it means that we are in symbolically this state. And if we go, I am me, I am free, hey, you on the tractor, see ya. And everyone does that, and God, the tractor's lost his power. He's not in control of the situation anymore because we've taken control back. And if the sheep did that, this guy would have no control over them. The idea is to lock us into a belief system, lock us into a uh, suppressed and uh, encased reality, and it's called fear. And fear puts you in your shell. He's, he's ever so insecure, he's always in his shell, I'm trying to bring him out of his shell. All these bloody phrases we use absolutely describe what we're talking about. And we get stuck in the bloody box. Oh, I'm going to Oxford this year, pass me exam. Freedom or freedom? Freedom is what controls this reality. It's what controls our uh, energetic state, our vibrational state, our density, and all the rest of it disconnects us. Freedom is what can set us free. And, and fear of what? As um, Gandhi said, today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Was it worth it? Was it? I don't... A lot of people, they're going to the dentist and they're going, oh God, I've got to go to the dentist in three weeks' time. Oh my God, I'm ever so worried. Oh no, oh God, oh no, I can't go out and worry. No, no, about the dentist. Three weeks later, they're sitting in the waiting room. Oh my God, I've got to the dentist. Oh my God. Uh, um, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, this way. Oh my God. Oh. Five minutes later, walks out. Oh, no problem. We're all right. No, no problem. Spent three weeks of agony projecting forward. Fear of yesterday or tomorrow. Why? When we get caught in this thing about survival, it's very important. Because when we get into a point of survival, we get into the reptilian brain. We lock in there because that's our survival instincts and our survival mechanism. Survival. Survival of what? Survival of life. I don't want to die. A doctor saved me. And all this stuff. There is no death. There is only life. There is only infinite consciousness, infinite awareness, infinite eternal existence within all that is, has been, and ever will be. There are the two points of observation. One, survive, survive, survive. One, there is nothing to survive. Chill out, mate. Okay? That's what it's like. So, 
There are very two different ways of looking at things. When we lock into body consciousness, we can lock into survival mode. Why? Because the body software has many survival um, mechanisms and programs within it. And that's not a bad thing, that's a bloody good thing. Because within this reality, this survival instinct of the, the um, holographic level of uh, the, the body computer is a good thing. We wouldn't last long if that, those survival mechanisms weren't here within the computer, within the world that we live in. It's when they are the governor and take over. They don't just react in times when we're in danger. They are there all the time. Oh, I'm ever so worried. My mother used to say about a neighbor, it's being, it's being so worried that keeps her going. What? What? But so many people, and you know, you, you know, you know I, and I noticed this from earlier in my life. I could worry for flipping England. You know, I ain't standing here cross-legged on a bloody mountain saying I've got, I'm, I'm speaking to, 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 to my disciples and all that shite. I have been through all this shit and continue to go through a lot of it. So when I'm talking about these things, I'm talking to my sodding self as much as I'm talking to anybody else. And, and uh, this, is, this, is, this is what we all experience. It's not about this or that. God, the shite I've been through, I, I could, oh God, emotionally and all that other stuff. And so, when we get caught in that, we get caught in body consciousness. And you get people, uh, 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 I call it emotional addiction. I, I, I had this at one time. An emotional addiction, you know the receptors of the cells that take in heroin and cocaine and all that stuff? Um, they... Um, are the same receptors that take the chemicals caused by emotions. Because emotions create a chemical reaction in the body, and vice versa. And it's the mercury and the fillings and all that stuff. And it can, we can get into a state of emotional fear and fear of not surviving. It's kind of a, 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 all different expressions of that. Where we need a fix when there's nothing to worry about. I noticed that. I felt, I felt uncomfortable. I was almost in, you know, emotional cold turkey at one time in my life when I didn't have anything to worry about. Because I, it's an emotional state, it's a chemical state, it's a drug state. And it's a body consciousness state, which is, has these survival programs. When we move our consciousness to this level, then we know there's nothing to survive. And so the survival instincts, while they can react on a body level to um, uh, physical danger, quote, they're not constantly um, constraining and influencing our reality. Now, what is there to worry about? What is there to fear of not surviving when you hear this? Everything from the beginning, my birth, my ancestors, my children, my wife, everything comes together simultaneously. I saw everything about me and about everyone who was around me. I saw everything they were thinking now, what they thought then, what was happening before, what was happening now. There is no time, there is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of place, of time. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. What is there to fear surviving or not surviving when we move to that level of consciousness? That's the level, if we get to it, and we can, we can come from that within physical embodiment, or what we call it, suddenly our lives transform, and if enough people do it, this reality transforms. Know thyself. That's something that we've been um, manipulated not to know. Don't ask questions, know the answer. When we're thinking, oh, uh, questions, 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 we're actually saying to ourselves, I don't know the answer. When if we just um, uh, get to that level of knowing, of intuitive knowing, you find the uh, answer without asking the question. You just know. This asks questions, trying to work things out. Chatter, 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 chatter. Wonder what that is. The reason at the level of intuitive Knowing the connection to higher awareness, you know the answer without asking the question, is because instead of um, asking the question within isolated consciousness, disconnected from infinite awareness, you're now connected to infinite awareness. 
So instead of asking the question, you know the answer, because infinite awareness is the all-knowing. There is where the answers lie. Without asking the questions, you just know. I, I just know I've got to be so-and-so tomorrow. How do you know that? I don't know. I can't explain it. I just know. And you go, and what happens? Something happens that takes you forward. Where is she? You'd have gone, no, I can't. I, no, I can't do that. No, no, you can't do that. You've got things to do. You've got to go to the supermarket tomorrow. I feel to go there. This intuitive level of knowing is our connection to higher consciousness. And this is, if you, if you watch it, always at war with, with intuition. Nearly always. And... Uh, when we go with this intuitive knowing, again, right brain, and, 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 and don't let the left brain dominate. You can't do that, you've got a mortgage, and you've got, you've got an appointment tomorrow. You can't do that, you can't go to India. No, you've got a mortgage, all that stuff. This is always telling us what we can't do, because it thinks in such limited terms of structure. This tells us what we are and what we can do. And if we choose to go with it, then we start to break out of this mind prison. And I have to say, what changed my life, I say more than anything else, was when I decided, funnily enough, just before I started to have these, this awakening, I decided, because of experiences I had, experiences I didn't like again, but were a wonderful gift, I decided that if I ever had a situation again, where my intuition said one thing and my head said another, I was going with my intuition every time. And I... And I went with it, and I went with it, and I went with it, and you may have noticed, it got me into a bit of trouble sometimes. It got me into a bit of trouble. But what, and, and what happens then when you follow your intuition and you get into a bit of trouble? I got into a bit of trouble, Betty, and all that stuff. Um, no one remembers that either. My bloody age, I don't know. This, this guy crosses the arms. See, I bloody told you, didn't listen to me, get into trouble. Oh, I know, should have listened to me. A lot of people go, yeah, I know, I know, oh, no, I'll never do that again. But if you keep going with your intuition, you keep following this knowing, these, these urges, these passions of what you want to do with your life and where you want to go and where you want to be, eventually, the sequence of, uh, of uh, situations leads the left brain, which is an observer of reality, and if you talk its language, it can kind of come round. Um, and it says, hold on a second. When you follow your intuition, you, you get into a bit of trouble, but then that led to that, and that led to that, and that led to that. Oh, it works out in the end, doesn't it? And what happens, and this happened to me um, around the mid-90s, what I felt intuitively, and what I... Uh, thought became one. So there was the war stopped. I want to do this. No, you've got to do that. You've got to do this. It stopped. And now the, the, the operate as one unit because this has seen enough of what intuition does to go, okay, I can see it. I'll go with this. And it's open to anyone to do that, to stop that war between intuitive knowing because they should be working as one unit. They shouldn't be at war. All these different elements that decode reality should be working as one unit to do this. And then, then we can start controlling our own reality. Knowingly in awareness, because we're doing it anyway. And what these manipulators do, because they know this system, they impose and implant belief systems which then affect our energy field, which then draw to us uh, decoded reality, daily experience, that matches the belief systems that have been programmed into us. They are programming our reality through us. And when we clear that out, we then can consciously start to create our own, which is the worst nightmare of the manipulators. Worst nightmare. It was, it was in the, in the Matrix movie when the Neo character um, went through the uh, death experience and, and, and came through it and realized it was an illusion and he stopped seeing people in the holographic world, as I would put it, as people and started seeing them like that when he realized it was all an illusion. That's when he was able to control his own reality. There's a lot in that movie that's true. And as we um, change our own energy field, we are then able to 
make that consciousness change available to other people. In this hundredth monkey syndrome they talk about, which is connection between people. And then we come system failure in this crap. Now, I've got ten minutes left (laughs) before they throw me out. So I want to talk about this, and it comes on the end of all that I've talked about in this last section. There very much seems to be a shift in consciousness going on. When I first... um, When I first woke up, amazing things were happening to me, and I didn't understand them. One of the themes at that time, we're talking 1990, was that there was a consciousness shift coming. I kept meeting psychic people a lot in those days, and they kept saying, I'm getting something, I'm being told to tell you this. And again and again, it was, there's a consciousness shift coming. There is an awakening coming. People are going to come out of the trance in effect. And it's happening now. And now as the, as the 90s have become uh, the, the new century, more and more this stuff about this, this shift is uh, going on. An energy shift, which is um, acting like a spiritual alarm clock. And I've seen it. All over the world I've seen it. People starting to get it and wake up and see the true magnitude of who they are. This energy change is happening. Um, and therefore, those that open their minds to it are starting to access and decode different frequencies, different ranges of reality, which are starting to change their experienced reality, from division to oneness. And there's a lot of talk about 2012 and the Mayan calendar and all that stuff. Um, I have to say, I'm not one of those people that say everything's going to change in 2012. I don't see that. What I see is that this is a symbolic or more than symbolic window when terrific change is going to take place. And one, this cycle that we've been through is changing to another cycle which is going to be very different and far more near paradise than the prison that is emerging. And I, uh, I, uh, in 1990, you know, I'm not really big into channeled information and stuff when, you know, psychics take all this stuff. You can get really good ones when you get out, when they really get out there. And you can get some really profound stuff which takes you on. But a, a, a lot of stuff is, is, um, is not like that. But some of it is. And in 1990, I experienced this. And it stood the test of time in my experience. It was a, a lady who um, channeled this... Uh, Consciousness back in 1990 when I was like, you know, in la la land, what's happening to my life? And um, I'll just read what it said because it's so relevant to now um, with the hindsight of the years that have passed. And if anyone doesn't, you know, believe in shape shifting, they should have seen this woman's face when she was doing this because she became someone else. Her face, it was like, whoa, um, changed to a completely different uh, face. And this is what it said. I feel you are sensing now the energies coming in, the energies surrounding your planet. This is causing many of you to ask questions. It is causing many of you to reevaluate completely your way of life, where you feel you wish to go, what you want to do. It is causing tremendous upheavals. Some of these upheavals are very confusing, very distressing, very disturbing. Some people in partnerships are finding they can no longer continue in those partnerships because their partners cannot tune into what they are tuning into. This is causing a great deal of disturbance. And I have said to this sensitive on more than one occasion that you must organize yourselves into groups to support each other. Now then, my own allegiance with your planet goes back to an Atlantean period when there were many energies being used and information and knowledge being used which were, for particular reasons of safety, withdrawn, shall we say to prevent complete catastrophe, to prevent total destruction of your planet. One could say these were sort of emergency measures, if you like, to prevent the inhabitants of this planet from an untimely destruction. Now at that time, shall we say, this knowledge was distributed only to the few. It was taught in what could call, uh, you could call a temple setting, though I'm very careful about using this word. It has connotations, maybe. So let me use that word in the broadest possible sense. There were those initiated into this knowledge, there were grades of initiation, and those who passed the full initiation, these were known as the guardians of the light and the keepers of the secret knowledge. This is the context from which I'm coming. There was a time when this knowledge and the energies were withdrawn. It is very difficult for me to explain to you precisely what I mean by that, so I will let you mull these things over. 
As the energies around your planet quicken, this is 1990, so these latent energies, these energies which have been withdrawn, will now be phased back in. They will gradually be awakened. As the consciousness level of your planet raises itself, those of you who are working together to raise your consciousness, you will be able to hold more and more refined vibrations, and so you will be able, we will be able to use you as a catalyst to be able to feed in more and more um, energies. Because as we change, we bring this um, change into this reality. As more of you raise yourselves to meet the challenge, so we can awaken more of these energies. Now, energy is consciousness, and the energies themselves contain the knowledge and the information which is beginning to service again in your consciousness. So many of you will remember the Atlantean times. You will remember that you communicated with, say, dolphins and whales. You understood these sentient creatures. You could levitate. You could manifest things. You could cause spontaneous combustion by not miraculous means at all. Once you know what you're doing, these things follow. It is a matter of order. Now, I'm looking at a time on your planet when these energies, this knowledge is reawakened and reintegrated into your consciousness. I'm not looking at a time when this knowledge will be for the few, but when your whole planet will be awakened to this understanding, which you have simply forgotten. It is not a matter of new information. It is a matter of remembering who you are and where you come from. So you are being asked to change. You are being asked to change in a total way. It is not a matter of small change. There's a little thing here, a little thing there. You are really being asked to turn yourselves inside out. There is such a massive shadow which must be cleared and it is up to um, uh, workers such as you to focus yourself on that challenge. Those of you who are in the forefront of this, you are rather like a snow plow. You are the thin end of the wedge. You really have, how shall I put it, to a certain extent I suppose, you have the shitty end of the job. You have an awful lot to do, but nevertheless you are capable of doing an awful lot. That is why you've chosen to come. That is why you've come here for, to really shovel some shit and therefore make some space behind you to make it easier for the others. As in your human body, there are energy lines and uh, meridian lines around your planet through your planet, which correspond, I suppose, very much to the acupuncture lines and meridians in your body. Where two lines cross, you create a vortex, a tiny vortex if it's two. The more lines that intersect, the bigger the vortex. Therefore, when you have a chakra, you have a large vortex of intersecting energy. The same with your planet. Where the most lines cross, there is the biggest vortex. Now, you could say that the plexus in and around the islands that you call the British Isles is the hub of the wheel of plexuses and energies which surround your planet. It has acted in other times like a fail-safe device. In order to activate these chakra points upon your planet, the energies must all cross through the central point. They must all pass through the heart of the pattern. And it's no accident, I would suggest, that Britain and London and Scotland and whatever are one of the major centers for the hybrid bloodlines and the Illuminati on the planet because they understand the significance of its place, not because of it's a country, but its point on this um, energy grid. And this is why there are more stone circles and standing stones in, in uh, Britain, particularly on the western side, than anywhere else in the world per square mile. It's a very, very important place um, in, um, in energetic terms on the planet. And my, my feeling about this uh, awakening is that this is very, very much involved. I've got a, a lot more to do on this, to say the least, but I'm sure that the sun is far more than a source of heat. It is a place or a, 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 um, uh, an opening, a gateway, where great energetic change and code changes come into this solar system, same with others all around what we call the universe. And I, I'm, I feel that at the elite level, not among the general population, one of the focuses on the sun or the reasons for the obsession with the sun is the knowledge of this, um, right going back to the ancient world. I also feel that the, the black holes and stuff are also ways that these energetic codes come in and out of this reality. 
So we're in a situation where there is an energetic change. More and more people are feeling it. Of course, people who are more awake are going to feel it first. But even people you thought were never going to kind of open their minds to this, now they're doing the same. Something's going on. And it's going on in the period that in the 1990s I was told it was going to go on. And we can flow with it, get in the right brain, hey man, and just go with it. And uh, let life take us where it needs to go intuitively. Um, or we can fight it. And, and in which case we're going to expend more and more and more energy, getting more and more stressful, trying to stay still and to hold on to the way things were, as if the way things were in this manipulated reality are the way things we always want them to be. So this change is uh, giving us even a bigger opportunity um, to, um, to change the nature of the way we see the world and ourselves. And I think it's no accident, the more I understand this, that it's now of all times that this great Orwellian stuff is being thrown at us in every way, in food additives and, and, and electromagnetic uh, uh, pollution and uh, uh, manipulation and all the programming and all the surveillance and all the microchipping. It's, it's a response to the fact that they know this change is taking place and they're trying to suppress it so uh, fewer people as possible actually start to lock into it and become transformed by it. Because when we do, we're no longer in a smaller box than they're in and therefore they're no longer in control. And this whole game of soldiers can just break up because it's a house of cards it's a house of cards and we are holding it together. When we go, whoops, thank you very much, not holding that up anymore, bang, gone. We are holding it together. That's the point. It's not that they have constructed this, they have manipulated us to construct it. You cannot solve problems with the same level of consciousness that created them. No, but the same level of consciousness is not where we're going now. We're going to another one, to change our reality. And it's a time to choose. A time to choose if we want to flow with this and become uh, the full magnitude of who we are, or whether we want to stay in the box like little frightened mice, saying, oh my God, I can't say boo to a goose, the goose won't like it. Free your mind and let nothing and no one enslave it is a great uh, uh, motto uh, for uh, everyone, I would suggest, including myself. As Menken said at the start of this event today, I believe that any man that takes the uh, liberty from another into his keeping is bound to become a tyrant, and that any man who yields up his liberty in however slight the measure is bound to become a slave. That's how we got into this. Voltaire, so long as the people do not care to exercise their freedom, those who wish to tyrannize will do so. For tyrants are active and ardent and will devote themselves in the name of any number of gods, religious or otherwise, to put shackles on sleeping men. We have created it because we have become sleeping men and women. We can do things on a physical level, which are a reflection of our changing consciousness, like ceasing to cooperate with the system of control. We've had, a, we've had a discussion outside the White House. We've had a discussion and we've decided this is going to happen. Mass of the people. No, it's not. We ain't doing that. Where's the power? Gone. Gone. The power is with us. And we have been cooperating with the building of our own prison. When we cease to cooperate, the prison can't be built because there's not enough people um, who, who, to do it if the people who are being enslaved don't do it to themselves. As um, Albert Einstein said, the pioneers of a warless world are the youth that refuse military service. <laughs> I want to stop war. Well, don't fight then. Don't fight. If they don't fight and they don't fight, where's the war? It's used to say in the 60s, what if, what if we had a war and no one turned up? No fripping war. And, and, you know, support our troops, they tell us. The people who say that in the dark suits are, are, are sending young kids to the slaughter just to serve their bloody agenda. That's how much they want to support our troops. Sodom. 
They never fight the wars. Have you noticed that? George Bush declares a war. George Bush declares a war. If he'd have been on the front line when the first bullet was fired in Iraq, he'd have been under a bed in Houston when the second bugger went off. These people don't fight wars. They send young people to fight bloody wars. When they don't, there's no bloody war. That's what we need to do. And it's like religions. So, you know, the guy, the guy in another country, the leader, he sends his youth off to war. This guy in this country sends this youth off to war. The two youths fight each other. For what? For two pairs of prats with an agenda that they even know about, probably. If we can move our point of observation from in this world um, to the out-of-body state, then we change our reality. And in an out-of-body state, if we ask ourselves, so often, you know, I, I, say, I say this, what would change this world dramatically uh, overnight is if everyone started doing what they knew to be right instead of what they thought was right for them in the moment. What a transformation that would be. All the time, we, we, we intuitively know what is right, but it's like, yeah, but, but what are the consequences for me? What are the consequences for me of what stops, stopping this transformation of this world happening? Because, oh yeah, I think it's unjust, but if I do something about the unjustness of this, what will, what will be the consequences for me? People say to me all the time, insiders, look, I'll give you this information, but ooh, you know, don't mention my name, will you? All right, I'll do it then. And, and when, um, when we get to that point where we're doing what we know to be right, instead of doing what we think is right for us in the moment, then everything changes. And what is right for us in the moment? Only what body consciousness thinks it is. In the out-of-body state, when we're, we're, we're in that state, are we saying, oh my goodness me, I ain't half glad that I didn't do what was right there because I'd, I'd have had a bit of a problem here. No, no, we'd have said, oh, sh I wish I'd have done what was right there because that was the right thing to do. That's the point of observation when we're out of this program reality. As Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Injustice for people we don't like is just as important as um, injustice against people we do. What would oneness do? That's the question. If we were in that oneness state, what would it do in this situation? Would it say, what are the consequences for me, or would it do what it believed to be right? As this man said, it is, if it's not right, don't do it. If it's not true, don't say it. Well, okay, that's changed the bloody world straight away. As Martin Luther King said, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. Infinite love, infinite consciousness, the existence of an infinite consciousness is the only truth. Everything else is, the, is illusion, it's the imagination of that consciousness made manifest. Gandhi said, strength does not come from physical capacity, it comes from an indomitable spirit, an inspirable will. And that's the will to do what we know to be right, both for ourselves and for the greater good, because we are ourselves and we are the greater good. Getting out of this thing, fearing what other people think, fearing our shadow, fearing anything. We are infinite consciousness, having an experience. There's nothing to survive, there is nothing to fear. This is our natural state. It's about time we went back to it. As William Reich said, so I started off with this, we should not fear to enter a forest because there are wild cats in the trees. We should not yield our right to well-controlled speculation. It is certain questions entailed in such speculation which administrators of established knowledge fear. But in entering the cosmic age, we should certainly insist on the right to ask new, even silly questions without being molested. We must take that right. You want to laugh at me? Good, have a good laugh. Please, for you. You want to condemn me for what I'm saying because it's outside the norm? Great, fine. You have a right to say that. I have a right to say this. Everyone's a winner. This is what's happening now. We're starting to wake up and we have the opportunity now. It's a wonderful time to be alive because all these things are coming together in this point we call time. 
where we have the opportunity to break out of this cycle of uh, mental and emotional imprisonment. We're being offered the key with knowledge, with understanding, with uh, uh, the gathering, opening, awareness, and with the energy change that's underpinning that. It's now a time for us to decide if we're going to take the key and turn it with all the implications that has for the challenges in this reality, but my goodness me, the freedom of becoming and returning to the true magnitude of who we are and leaving behind this false identity that we have been manipulated to believe is us. There it is. There's the key for everyone, all of us, me too, to go like that. It's up to all of us to choose if we're going to do it. It's about time we did, I feel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.